To the substances of terror, he was sufficiently alive, but of its shadows, he had no apprehension. Greetings, Poe fans. We welcome you to our Facebook Live this evening, and we welcome Jason Markowitz of Markowitz Productions. And I'll let him go ahead and introduce himself a little bit more. For you. Hey, everybody. And Carmen and Jeannie, thank you very much for having me on tonight. Uh, I am Jason Markiewicz, and I formed an audio drama company called Markiewicz Audio Works a couple of years ago. And we have been producing five works of Edgar Allan Poe uh, before moving on to other authors. But we started where uh, we really enjoyed the work and really enjoyed the style of, of writing and wanted to produce those as our first five productions. And so far, so good. Thanks again for having me on. Yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are really looking forward to this evening. All right, okay, so anyway, thank you again for joining us. And yes. so for this evening, we are going to wish Edgar Allan Poe his 214th happy birthday. Wherever and he may be. That's exactly right. <laughs> And we are going to also do a toast at the end of the episode uh, before we um, disembark from the internet. And so, but our main focus tonight is horror and Vincent Price, who was heavily influenced by Edgar Allan Poe. And we're just going to discuss a little bit about him, his background and the works and just wherever that conversation will go. Exactly. So and away we go. Yes. And so um, I, I read the book, I'm going to hold this up, The Price of Fear by Joel Eisner, uh, which was a very, uh, very informative book about Vincent Price. Um, Jason, have you, um, like, I know you said, you know, quite a bit about him and really love Vincent Price. I do too. Have you read or like any books by him? Because I know there's other no. two. No, I haven't read. I, I love biographies and, and uh, I just did a quick look up on some works uh today okay. just to see what other you know products are out there because i've seen a bunch of the films and uh, tv series and yes. you know I, en I enjoyed his voiceover work and and everything but um the books no not yet and, and you just showed that one up and that's going to be on the to-do list it's it's really really good and it's it's a short read and there's uh, a foreword in here by um let's see hold on it's it is by Peter Cushing, which I thought was really. Oh, cool. yeah. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, it like from one of the things that Joel Eisner talks about is that Victoria Price, his daughter, um, approved the book and things like that. It's very well done. It goes kind of basically from birth to death and all of his works. And um, I just I found it fascinating. And what was really kind of cool, because the majority of my family is from the Missouri. And so mm. he was born in St. Louis, Missouri. And yeah. so I thought that was really neat. But um, but he was, I, th I think some people just assume he all he did was horror. If you don't like know a whole lot about him. Mm -hmm. But um, he had a bachelor's of arts degree in English from Yale University, which I thought, wow. Yeah. And, and not only that, but you look at the fact that he was a art collector yes. and an art historian. And I yes. mean, it was a lot of things outside of the, the horror genre. Absolutely. And um, his love of cooking and visiting. Right traveling. I actually have one of his cookbooks. It's actually back on a shelf over here. Um, <laughs> it's, it weighs like 25 pounds. I think. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, he loved cooking. Yes, absolutely. And, um, but he began acting around the age of 23 at the gate theater in London and basically kind of what kind of took off from there in 1938 he joined Orson Welles' group um, at the Mercury Theater. And so I think that's kind of where it kind of jump started from there for his acting career. And his first, first gothic horror movie was in 1946, Dragon Wick. Have, have you guys seen that one? I haven't had a chance to see that one, no. No. No, it, it, I, it's been a while since I've seen it, but it, it's it's very good. And it's it's a black and white film. Um, and I love the old classic films like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely one to put on your list to watch. I like yeah. how you brought in the Orson Welles tie. Yes, because Vincent Price and especially all the others during that time period with Boris Karloff and all those mm -hmm. other ones, that is right 
you know, after the Great Depression, so a lot of America was glued to the radio. Yes. Because that was how FDR made his announcements and everyone. That was the only thing they had. There was no big television, moving theater uh, had just started to popularize again, but they were still silent films because you had Charlie Chaplin and all those going on. But Vincent Price, one of the things that I think make him so renowned, just like the other actors mm-hmm. uh, in in our time period, is his voice. Yes. Because yeah. you have to have something as to bring in the audience, to bring in those fan bases. Yes. And so Orson Welles getting Vincent Price or him attaching to him was just phenomenal because mm-hmm. Orson Welles took off because of War of the Worlds. Yes. And the radio, and now we're going to live theater. So Vincent Price, he was he was hitting it right when it needed to be. And I think it was just like one of those synergies where everything kind of lined up. He had the right people at the right time. Mm-hmm. So if that hadn't happened, who knows? Exactly. He, he also had the right look. Exactly. As well. yes. And yes. and a lot of times, you know, when you look at who gets cast for roles, you know, sometimes it's how you audition. Sometimes do you look the part someone's looking for? Mm-hmm. And and you you had the thin, angular, you know, uh, appearance with him. And, and it was just you know, very well cast and, and very well done on a lot of the, the roles he did, especially in the, the post series in the sixties. Oh yes, a- absolutely. And just the, his, his stature, his height mm-hmm. and just right. his presence. I, yeah, I totally agree. And he played so many diverse roles, um, you know, inside and outside of horror. Mm-hmm. It's just, it, it's absolutely amazing. Um, so so kind of, I would say, Jason, kind of tell us a little bit about your productions that you're doing. It's kind of veering a little bit off Vincent Price, but we'll tie it all back in. Well, I'll, I'll start a little bit with uh, Vincent Price uh, and kind of bring it around because, you know, when you look at at the way um, Edgar Allan Poe's works have been used over the, you know, 150 years, I guess, you know, and you look different books and different productions, and then you're mm-hmm. looking at movies and now podcasts and audio dramas and you name it. Um, you know, there's a few people that have done many things, you know, and mm-hmm. Vincent Price did, I think, eight Poe movies between 1960 and about 64, 65. Yeah. And and they were they weren't exact carbon copies of Poe's work. Mm-mm. And they they all had a little bit of Hollywood built in. They had a different script. They they uh, covered the main themes, but they were unique productions to themselves. And, and I really enjoyed that. And which is exactly one of the things, and I wouldn't say it's because of him, but it's, it's very similar to the style of those movies that we decided to take a different look at each of the Edgar Allan Poe works, bring something new into it, create a different character, uh, change some dialogue, put in some different circumstances and create productions that are honoring Edgar Allan Poe and his work but yet mm-hmm. unique enough to be um, individually ours. And that was important to us when, when writing the script, when doing the music, uh, putting in the effects, uh, creating the, the characters, casting the actors, you name it, uh, to have a, a unique production that could not just be another Edgar Allan Poe story that's being done uh, with another group of people, but it's a, a story that can stand alone on its own. And I think that was that was something we really tried hard to do, but still be very... Um, honorific uh, to the original work. Absolutely. And I think people really appreciate people doing adaptations in that fashion Mm -hmm. because it does kind of keep the interest peaked of, you know, we we love Poe, but what can you add to it to embellish it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I wanted to make sure that I even write little intros and before each of our audio dramas, there's a short one and a half or two minute introduction that kind of leads in a little bit to the story. Sometimes it's a a, a little bit of a caricature of what you will hear in the upcoming story, but it's also to explain a little bit of what you will see maybe that's different from what you knew of the story so that it's not taken under a, Hey, wait a minute. That's not the way that goes. Well, you're right. It's not supposed to be. And Mm so bring a little bit um, of of context to it before the audio drama begins. 
And I think that's been very good to establish a groundwork because I don't want it to feel like we're doing an analysis of his story. It's right. meant to be a, a different take, a different adaptation, but still someone can leave there saying, I feel like I got the context of a Casco Montiato or of the Telltale Heart. Um, and that's important to us. Ab- absolutely. And, and it's just another way to, sh- to showcase your art form and to add that just a little bit of difference and mm-hmm. um, to celebrate Poe. But at the same time, he's having to cater to a current audience that right. may not have that literary right. want or love yeah. for even, or even oh, background. Yeah. yeah. In, yeah. Or, or, or interest, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Hear, yes. Yeah. You hear about, you know, books in the public <laughs> domain and, you know, a lot of a lot of people don't think of of uh, that as, you know, entertaining reading, you know, and, exactly. and you, you've got to you've got to bring it to a a generation that may not be as uh, entranced with the works from the, you know, 19th century as I am. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that I loved when I checked out your YouTube and everything is I do love those old radio shows. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved how just listening to a story and hearing the way that someone can use their voice to inflect the story and make it and build it and create that imagination, which I think a lot of of this generation is losing in the social media because everything is just given and shown to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not, not them having to build it in their own mind. So absolutely. That's one of the things that I love the most about you maybe changing a few things, but still keeping the essence Mm -hmm. of what you want. I appreciate that. I know we, uh, in the telltale heart, part of my introduction is, you know, we took, uh, an, an amount of diligence to create sound effects that can bring the listener into the story, mm-hmm. but not immersed to the point where you can't imagine what's going on on your own. I want those eerie silences of, you know, strange things happening in the dark to still be able to be in someone's mind without me telling you or hearing everything. Mm-hmm that sometimes the the silence itself is haunting enough. Exactly. I, I agree. And I, I love listening to audiobooks on my way to school every day. And sometimes I'll mm-hmm. listen in the afternoon too, if I'm not too tired. And that was one right. thing I did really like um, and love about your productions is just, it was very captivating. Like I, I didn't lose interest because I've listened to some books that I'm like, oh my gosh, is this going to be over soon? And I never lost interest. And I'm like, I want more and more, you know. Great. Thank you. You you do a really great job. Thank you. Tying back into the Vincent Price thing. Mm -hmm. It's the voice. His voice, just like with Sean Connery, Sam Elliott, you know, those iconic voices that you just cannot forget. Mm -hmm. And Vincent Price's voice was built, in my opinion, for horror. Because yes. he has that low, that, you know, haunting type to his voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was very much catered to Edgar Allan Poe. Well, and he was Shakespearean trained. Exactly. So. That, that has a lot to do with it, too. Yes. So he knows how to tell a story. Yes. He knows how to use what he's got. Absolutely. Um, and his ability to move his character. You know, yes. from yes. from the beginning to the end, you know, you talk about character growth and the way that your character changes uh, through the course of the story. I, I think of his work in Mask of the Red Death. Oh, yes. And, oh, yes. And it, it started spooky, but it ended, you know, devilish. Yes. And, and his <laughs> his you know, I mean, his character changing uh, to a degree where you you almost saw a a, a madness kick in as it, as it yes. got closer and closer toward the end mm-hmm. and, and just the way, and it didn't look forced. It was very natural. He just did a great job embodying, you know, that character the entire time. It was, it was impressive. Yeah, I, I agree that that's one of my favorite stories to read, um, to teach mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. to watch the movie. And the one thing I love about that, that Corman film is the colors because 
Poe oh, yes. describes the colors in such vivid detail. Now, Gorman used a few colors that are not what Poe used, and I'm okay with that. But the the technicolor, I guess, of what mm-hmm. they use, I, I'm assuming that's what they used, but it was so bright and vivid. And I, I got the opportunity um, to watch right around Halloween with a really good friend of ours um, on 4K because it had just been, I think, released and Oh my gosh. It, I, I saw it like I've never seen it before. It was amazing. Yeah, no, it, it was, it was interesting. Cause I, I watched it, uh, read the story and everything as we were starting to do, um, the script for our production of mask of the red death, which okay. we're, we're in, you know, we've recorded it. It's in production now. Oh, wonderful. And, and part of, uh, what I wanted to do was, you know, see various different styles, you know, make sure that nothing that we did could be like, oh yeah, I've seen so-and-so do that before. Or I saw that mm-hmm. on this movie, you know? So I want to make sure that when you listen to ours, that it is original and it has a, a, a vision to it that, that can be unique. And I honestly, we haven't seen them all, you know, I, I don't make yeah. that claim that I have, but <laughs> yeah. you, you try to do some homework, you know, you try to do some homework and make sure that you do your best, you know, to bring an, an original take to something. But mm-hmm. I, I was really struck by the rooms. And, and I know that in an audio drama, when so much is visual, that can be very challenging. And so how do we negotiate the colors of the rooms and what happens Mm -hmm. in each? And I think we came up with a pretty good solution, um, you know, to where it's not just someone listening to, oh, okay, well, this is basically like gone into an audio book now, you know, it's still dramatized, but it had to be done in a way that I, I wanted to keep that piece of it. And it was difficult to try to work that into a script. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I will look forward to to listening to that once you are you have it in you know out for everybody yeah. to see. That'll be our fifth and final one. Oh, okay, oh. okay. Now I think. Do you are you doing other uh, productions of different literature for? Oh. The plan is for sure. You know, okay. we started with Edgar Allan Poe, you know, for a couple of reasons. One is I, I love his work. Yes. But the, the, and I had been, I think I wrote the script for The Raven in 2011. And oh, wow. it took me 10 years to, to get it to a point and my own skills, I guess, to a point where I could feel like, let's go ahead and actually do this. Okay. And, okay. and they're, you know, digestible, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, sometimes up to half an hour. And so mm-hmm. you're, you're not biting off too much. But uh, you're certainly able to produce a good story. And, and uh, we really enjoyed that. But we do plan to go on to other works. And I think Treasure Island is where we're Ooh, currently oh, looking yes. for the next go and okay. how to figure how to do that one uniquely. Yes. Cool. Oh, that that sounds amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I can only imagine just especially like you say, taking the visuals and making them such you know quality audio to like you said Mm -hmm. not lose the interest of the listener and um, making them so vivid I was Mm going to say um, here lately with my students we've been working on figurative language and imagery has been a very big thing and sometimes all they talk about is just the the visual things and I'm like no you've got to you've got to use your other senses and so Mm -hmm. Um, but we read a lot of things out loud and discuss and annotate and everything else. And so, um, but uh, kind of going back to Vincent Price and the Corman films, um, trying to think, I have seen all of them, but some of them I've seen more recently than others. The I finally watched Tomb of Ligia right around Halloween, and I really liked it. It was not my favorite of the films, but that was one of the last ones he did for Corman. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know if they, I, I don't know if it was like, okay, it was a good film, but it just, it didn't seem as interesting as some of the other ones to me. Well, it's, it's a, you know, I, I don't know, in, in my take on it, the other ones were more popular, like they were yes. more popular stories. And I think so you're you right. I think tackled you're right. a story that was lesser known uh, mm-hmm. and it didn't already have that that buy in. And so yes. sometimes that can be difficult. Yeah. And and I like the post story of Ligia, but yeah, I just I, I didn't connect with the film as much as I had hoped I would. But I, I liked it. I, I, I don't take me wrong. I didn't dislike it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. But I think my favorite of all of the Corman films is probably the first one they did um, with the House of Usher. Usher. Yes. 
Yeah. He he embodies. He became Roderick Usher, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I, I really. No, I, I fully agree, and I think that goes back, back to my original comment about casting. Yes. You know, and and the uh, ability for him to just you know embody that role. Of course, we see the finished product. You know, yes. there's oh yeah, you know, everything else that goes <laughs> along the way. Oh yeah. But uh, but he's you know he was meant for for these kind of roles, as you said, and this yes. this one was a, a great way to start. Plus, it was made so cheap, and it earned you know millions at the box office mm-hmm. in 1960. Yes. So this was that was a, a heck of a good production for he and the production company. Yeah. And one thing I read, which I thought was really interesting, was that the the last horror film he made before House of Usher in 1960 was The Fly in 1958. And one of the mm-hmm. things that um, the book alluded to and, and another article that I read mm-hmm. was that so I'm going to do the air quotes. Supposedly, mm-hmm. he might have been tired of you know doing horror at this point. And that they kind of roped him into House of Usher. Um, but I, I kind of I wonder if that's really true or not. You know, you kind of, you know. Well, during that time period, a lot of the, a lot of what Hollywood as a whole, I'm going to throw it out there, mm-hmm. was into is they were trying to utilize those actors that they knew were bringing in the public Mm -hmm. that everybody loved and they were a very staple of a certain character right like you know vincent price was very much a horror character boris karloff Mm -hmm. his main ones that you can think of were always designed because you know think of it boris karloff was in the august dupine the uh rue morgue murders Mm -hmm. And those kinds of things. So they were very much central on what they could bring to the table, but also what they could bring into the audience for the production companies, for those types of people. Uh, And so it was very much that time period, I think, because you had uh, Cagney coming in, you had, you know, Stewart, you had all Mm -hmm. those that were coming into the field that were taking the more melodramatic, in my instances, yes, and the more drama where the other ones were already in the staple of being cast in the horror. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of hurt rather than helped Mm -hmm. for casting wise. Yeah. Well, and I wonder too, and I don't know, I don't know the answer to this, but I know that um, it was fairly popular in that time to be on contract with a studio for X number Mm -hmm. of projects or films. And I don't know whether or not this may have been something that, that he got involved with Usher, but it was because of, having a longer term deal to do more of these pictures uh, as the years went on. I don't know. Yes, I, I do. One of the things, um, cause he was, let's say, cause it was AIP was the production company <laughs> that did this with Corman. Um, one of the things that I read, I'm kind of looking at my notes um, when he did, uh, let's see when Corman did the one Poe film that was not Vincent Price, it was The Premature Burial in 1962 with Ray Milland, or Ray Milland, mm-hmm. I always mispronounce that. Uh-huh. Um, apparently, Corman wanted to do it with AIP and wanted Vincent Price. And mm-hmm. I think at the, the very moment that it was going to start production, what happened was Corman had to end up recasting and finding Ray Milland and go a different production company. And mm-hmm. then that AIP came back and said, Oh no, we want to do this with Vincent Price. And he goes, well, I'm already started. And so that's how that one came about and kind of took a digression from Price and AIP. Okay. So he may have had a, a, a contract, you know, company contract with AIP yes. that, that worked that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, so, and, I can't, and I can't remember off the top of my head because um, that, that AIP may have ended up producing it in the long run, but it didn't start out that way. And so that mm-hmm. was kind of the, I, originally it probably would have been Vincent Price. And so then he came back in 1963 and did the Raven production and Peter Lorre's voice as the Raven is so awesome. (laughs) It's it's really a lot of fun. Um, One thing I wanted to kind of, I wanted to read a quote uh, from this book uh, that Vincent Price, um, fondly remembering his roles in the Poe films, he said, some of the Poe villains have been fascinating 
Um, they were loosely based on Edgar Allan Poe, who doesn't write villains. He writes about men who are put upon by life. This is a great difference between a horror villain and a man who has been put upon by life. And then he he goes on to talk about like Frankenstein and uh, the monster and things mm -hmm. like that and talking about a little bit about Mary Shelley. And so I, I thought I liked that quote a whole lot because it, it really sums up how Poe writes, you know, just in the horror vein. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, you know, you think about each of those characters, you can see something in them. You yes. know, you can see some of yourself in there. We've all been wronged. We've got a little monster yes. sore in all of us, right? You just hope you're not <laughs> oh, on the yeah. Fortunato end of things. That's right. You That's know, right. Uh, you've <laughs> lost somebody. You feel like the the poor guy in the Raven, you know, absolutely. and and uh, someone's irritated you for some odd reason. You can maybe see yourself in the telltale heart. You know, I mean, there's, yes. you can... <laughs> You know, you can, you can see, you can see how it's, it's scary because you can probably look a little bit inward and go, oh yeah. Okay. I got some of that. Yeah. That, that, that thought yeah. might've crossed my mind at some point or yeah. another. And Poe, yeah. It's been teachers. Yeah. And Poe epitomizes what it's always been told about someone who wants to be a writer. You know, everyone's always say the best writers are those that write about what they know. Yes. I mean, yeah. and Poe was the epitome of that. He, he wrote about tragedy. He wrote about his own life, mm -hmm. about his own struggles, his own black heartedness, if yes. we want to throw that in well, there. He was a, you know, the Tomahawk critic. So, yes. I mean, you know. so he had to have a little bit of resentment of those people around him, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. especially considering who is adopted foster father, yes, whatever father. you want to call yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, and the way he was treated, even though he was supposedly one of those in that time period of the well-bred, mm -hmm. he wasn't treated that way in most aspects because he was just the poster child, for lack of a better way yeah. of saying it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. He was the poster yeah. child. So and he just really brought that into his writing, into mm -hmm. his poems, into his into anything. And you just sit there as you're reading going. Yeah, I did that. Oh, I can see myself yeah. doing that. Yes. Exactly. You know, and especially like in the one with the black cat, mm -hmm. you know, how oh. he knows he's done something wrong, but he wants to share that. He wants to get accolades for what he did to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. It's like his wife was being mean to him, but he wanted to put a stop to it. And he did, but he wanted someone to share it with so mm -hmm. he could feel good about himself. And it turned, you know, like many things, no good deed goes unpunished kind of thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Um, and so Price also did two other Poe films that were, I, I kind of said, Sans Corman or Sans Corman, uh, The Oblong Box in 1969. And, and this one has two titles. It has the British title and it has the American title, mm -hmm. The Witchfinder General or Conqueror Worm. And that was in 1968. And I actually have not seen that one yet, but I've heard from a good friend. It's not as good as the Corman films, definitely. And then um, the Oblong Box, I have watched and it, it was a good film. It was a good film. I don't think it's as good as the Corman films, but it was it was a good one. It, it was good because it's very different. Yes. You know, yes. and and it's it's not the it's not the traditional gothic Poe mm -hmm. style, you know, and, yes. and I think I mean, there's of course you get the supernatural aspect and, and so mm -hmm. forth, but you know, it's uh, it's one of those nautical stories that uh, very, very different from the the remainder of them. And it, um, you know, it was one of, I think, three that he did that were kind of based nautically, you know, with uh, MS found in a bottle. You got yes. Oblong Box and um, yes. narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym, mm -hmm. you know. And so so with those, you've you've got uh, a very select few, but they were very influential on like pirate stories and ghost stories and things like that. But it was it's not the standard that you think of when you you think of just classic works of Poe. Yes. Oh, and even the gold bug, the gold bug as well. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I would love to see some of the Poe works that are not necessarily horror themed mm -hmm. become, you know, short movies or, you know, full length movies or productions. 
Um, I think it would be really interesting to see those done because, you know, all of the aspects of Poe's writing, you know, whether it be the science, the science fiction, you know, you know, offshoot from horror, just, or just, mm -hmm. just the literary type things that he did. Um, the, I guess the mysteries with the Dupin stories, Dupin stories, it, you know, we watched all three versions of the uh, Murders in the Rue Morgue and kind of critiqued those. And mm. they all had really good elements. And then so, then they all had a few elements that we didn't necessarily mm -hmm. like. And then we liked some movies more than others. But it was it was awesome to be able to look at all three and see the the neat things of how people adapted them. But it also boiled down to casting. Yes. Because George yes. C. Scott was by far the best Dupine casting. Yes. And it just once more goes back to those art, those artists as the yeah. actors mm -hmm. that can really bring the story into yes. play because they are storytellers and they know how to tell the story. Yeah. And put themselves in that character mm -hmm. and become that character. And Definitely. make you believe that character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And especially oh, George C. Scott is a great cast, no matter what he's, no matter what yes. he's doing. Yes, oh yes. <laughs> Just hearing his name and you're going, all right, I already picture it. You don't have yes. to do Absolutely. anything else. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. And then um, one of the other things, um, you know, Poe related with Price uh, was the 1970 uh, kind of one man show that he did, mm -hmm. um, an evening with Edgar Allan Poe. Have either of you seen that? No, oh. not not that one. Okay, I I found it um, free on a channel one day, and I, I, mm -hmm. I sewing is one of my hobbies, and so while I was sewing, I watched and listened to it, and it was absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And he so the the stories that he they chose to do was Telltale Heart the sphinx and the quote that i read at the very beginning was from that story um the cask of amontillado and the pit and the pendulum mm -hmm. and from what i read the sphinx was vincent price's favorite and so that you know he wanted to incorporate that and he basically said that it was not only the best thing that he had done, but it was his favorite thing he had done of all the Poe works and things like that, mm -hmm. because he he dressed up in the character and recited each of the stories, you know, separately, you know, throughout the production. And so that I, I just can't imagine like if that was performed live, like how amazing that would be to see him do that one man show. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it would just be the epitome of the actor, the writing, mm -hmm. you know, the cast of the whole scenery, because most of the time, and it's like when I used to teach, uh, was director of the theater arts, trying to get these children to understand that it's not the costume as much as it is the actor who's building the whole thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know you can have a great costume you can have a great set you can have props galore but if you don't have an actor who is believable and can bring all that together to make it happen then no one is going to buy into it no one's going to yeah. be there and just the thought of vincent price just you know storytelling just him sitting there like in the raven think about the raven mm -hmm. sitting there and you know, i could just hear his voice reciting the raven in a dark room and the pecking yeah. on the window and and it just it reminds me so much of just who he was yeah you know if you can think of an actor and you can automatically bring him to mind and put him in any kind of character mm -hmm. then that actor is a true actor yes He's he's what he needs to be. He's the man that can make you understand things because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. comprehension is a big thing. You know, that's why most people don't enjoy opera. That's why they say it's a love or hate issue. <laughs> you either love it or you hate it. There's no middle ground. Hey, what about a Poe opera? <laughs> oh, there you go. Think, I don't even think Poe would go that far. Maybe not. Maybe hey, not. Hey, just look at it this way. Opera. You can't even spell opera without Poe. So there you have exactly. it. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Love that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so there that works. Yeah. And so... Um, 
yeah, but Vincent Price, I mean, and kind of like talking about, like, mm-hmm. like you said, listening to some of the readings that he did of like the Raven and things like that. And then kind of going back to, you know, at the point of his career at the end of the 70s, it had kind of gone, you know, on a downward spiral, kind of, you know, the the autumn of his acting years. Mm-hmm. And then that resurgence in 1982, when they asked him to be the voice in Thriller. Yep. And that revived yep. his career. And then, you know, he went on to do, you know, the part in Edward Scissor's hands and all of that. And let's not forget Professor Radigan. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Great mouse detective. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. His voice work. Uh, oh, yeah. Is amazing. Yep. And so um, one of the things that I really want to watch is the Tim Burton short uh, about Edgar and Vincent and everything and um because apparently like both of poe and uh vincent price had a huge impact on him as well just from some of the reading i've done well anyone Mm. in the industry that has that kind of like tim burton is what we're talking about Mm -hmm. who has that love of the let's just say it the strange yeah because with <laughs> edward scissor hands and then nightmare before christmas and james and the giant peach and mm-hmm. you know anyone that has that type of visual acumen is going to be one of those that you can just relate it back to the, the yeah. greats of vincent price and all those because he shows it in his work mm-hmm. and any of us that have had like with edgar Allan poe with shakespeare any, any of us that have had those loves in our life, you can see it in some way in what we do for a living and Absolutely. what we love, what we write, what we do with anything, mm-hmm. because that is just the uh, the greatest accolade. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, think about this, the new Netflix series, uh, Wednesday, uh-huh. that's Tim yes. Burton, but yes. how many Poe references are in that? Exactly. From the Nevermore Academy to the Raven Ball. I mean, it's exactly. there. They're, yes. they're all over the place. Oh, yeah. yeah. And then uh, one of the things we are very excited about is the series of The Fall of the House of Usher, mm-hmm. which is coming mm-hmm. up soon. And um, we just watched uh, The Pale Blue Eye. Mm-hmm. I had uh, read the book and was so excited once I found out they were making the movie, even though it was not poe written the poe character Mm -hmm. and once i found out that harry melling was going to be cast as poe i was like he is perfect for that role i just that's that was just my looks like him (laughs) yes oh yes i don't know if you've seen it yet but it it is very well done it was kind of creepy yes but Mm -hmm. it should be it's i know but it was just creepy (laughs) i mean and don't don't give away i'm not going to i'm just saying he was creepy yeah, uh, it was creepy because seeing him and one of the, one of the things we kept talking about is we wanted to slap a mustache on him just yes. to say, <laughs> you know, would it be more Edgar Allan Poe with the mustache or is he right. more Edgar Allan Poe without the mustache? Yeah. So. Well, and and that that's kind of the the fun thing about Poe. Most people just associate the mustache with him and he only had the mustache in the last few years of his life. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think a lot of people know that. And mm. so unshaven is really you know probably more of who he was throughout most of his life probably took him that long to grow it could have been (laughs) been. (laughs) i mean i'm just saying but you know because and he had a lot of crap going on in the last years of his life too so true very true yeah Um, well, and um, so Jason, like just, you know, because we want to hear um, a little bit more about, you know, your influences, like, you know, like how much of a, of Poe, you know, just like in your background influenced you and just even other writers and things yeah, why for you to did do. You even want to do this to begin with. Right. You know, what yes. spurned this to happen? Yes. Okay. Well, um, so I, I guess I'll start with saying that. Um, you know, having been a, a theater performer for a few years, and then in 2020, when we got shut down for COVID and everybody got kicked out of the theaters and stages yeah. got closed and everything else, um, we were one week into our run of the dinner party at the time, and I was on stage as Claude Pichon. And uh, so that all got shut down, and I got to thinking, you know, what am I going to do as a, you know, theatrical entertainment kind of outlet during this time where now we're all at home. And so I took a class on audiobook narration and I've 
uh, been doing that for a few years now with uh, narrating, you know, two dozen audio books at this point. But oh, nice. I also created an audio drama company and I started it with a friend of mine who uh, was also a theater actor there in Sacramento, California. And okay. we did uh, the first uh, three productions we did as the two primary leads. Mm-hmm. And then in the the one production ma- um, manuscript found in a bottle, I did it solo. And then in the fifth production, Mask of the Red Death, we really opened it up, you know, for uh, a larger cast. Okay. But it was um, it was an effort to bring some stories that I really enjoyed to a a new audience, but done in a way that I was interested in it. And I I had a friend of mine, you know, where I I mentioned to her a a little while ago that, you know, artists create art for a variety of reasons. And Mm -hmm. it sometimes it's the pay, sometimes it's a notoriety, but I think most of the time it's because we love doing it. And, and you're going to create this because it's, it's your passion. It's a thing that you're most engaged in and the the product you want it to be good you want people to think it's good but you're it's your baby it's your passion project it's what you're putting your heart and soul into Mm -hmm. and what do i want to create as kind of our our uh, introduction to the world as an as an audio drama company and how do we do this well and so we we thought about doing uh, original works, uh, create a, a script that's, you know, just our own. And, and I've written a few and I just didn't feel like that was the way to go. And I wanted to create something that I enjoyed the story. It's a, a genre I enjoy. It's, mm-hmm. it's a, an, an author I enjoy. And how do I bring that now to an, a new type of a medium? And so I've read the stories and I've watched films and so forth, but I, I, I'm a big audio drama and audio book fan and have mm-hmm. listened to them for years and years. And this was and really heavily influenced by, uh, you know, companies like Macabre Mansion and L.A. Theater Works and Alien Voices, you know, really love that audio drama production uh, quality and wanted to, to really do that. But I didn't want to bite off a two or three hour project and some of these <laughs> post short stories, you know, 30 minutes or less and they're digestible in one sitting. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, where did I put that second CD? You know, you've got a chance to, yeah. to get them all done at one time and. And we really enjoyed it. And I think there was a lot of um, a lot of creativity put into Mm -hmm. producing it. Uh, Sound effects, you know, uniquely done, Uh, personally created a a multitude of them that are in our productions or ones that I did myself, recorded my own footsteps and boot steps and (laughs) up and down the stairs and opening shutters and throwing open blinds and pouring drinks. And (laughs) I mean, they're they're independently created in in Mm -hmm. the large majority. The ones that aren't, I credit in the back of the the production, which I think is a heavy wooden door opening and closing that obviously I don't have a gigantic castle door to be able to do that, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, I can't record a thunderstorm quite as well as the one I used, you know, uh, yes. that had an attribution license attached to it. So, yeah, you know, those yeah. two things were kind of out of my scope, but everything else I take shoes and, you know, walk on, on a desk and record that. And, uh-huh. um, you know, there's the sit up and, you know, get up and sit down on couches and just record all kinds of different things. And those things get utilized in that, the production. So that is really, that just sounds like fun. That it, like it's fun. great. It, <laughs> yeah. I, I wish I had a Foley table that, that had everything at a, at, at arm's reach and mm-hmm. be able to do these kind of in a live setting with a Foley artist. That'd be awesome. But right now, you know, they, they're individually captured and then recorded and I go on to the next effect. Um, but I think, I think we've done a pretty good job. Yes. Oh, absolutely. What I've listened to so far, it's great. It's really great. Yeah. And as you were describing that, I just automatically thought back to like the early 40s and 50s, those people that were in the sidelines behind the curtains and they had mm-hmm. to react on cue with yes. like ringing of the phone or beating something on the desk or mm-hmm. walking. And, you know, how like I used, I love Red Skelton. I don't know if anybody knows about Red Skelton oh, yeah. or watching oh, yeah. Red Skelton, but just, that type of comedy i know not a lot of it's comedy you know comedic in mm-hmm. especially in poe because we mm-hmm. talked about his tragic lives but in the comedy in those types of shows just anyone who barely gets anything off kilter and it's like oh you go back to abbott and costello you go back yeah. to the greats yes. that a lot of people don't know about and so it just just hear you talking about it and thinking about how we were confined during the covid thing because mm-hmm. i'm just picturing myself if i was your neighbor and hearing all this noise and 
you walking around and watching you through the window in the shadows and you're going should i call the police you know is there something going on uh, we we were wondering about that when i recorded the uh, screams for mask of the red death oh wow and, and we were recording that in an upstairs room and i had people screaming into the wall corners to try to get the right kind of echoes and yes all kinds of things and we're like how many times can we do this before someone thinks that there's something else going on in here Hi, it's a it's a poesque tale happening yeah. live. It, <laughs> it was the COVID equivalent to Hitchcock's rear window. There you go. Yep. <laughs> yep. I'm out in the backyard with an old uh, uh, pallet and a claw hammer, and I'm ripping up boards for the effects for Telltale Heart. So <laughs> that 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 would be amazing. Thinking yeah. of how you can recreate those sounds. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You should just made a video of doing all of that and having it like a blooper reel on yes. your YouTube channel. And yeah, that's going, that's oh. true. Yeah, I, I could probably recreate some of it, but I had I had so many times I would create one and I would just be so proud of it and I'd go listen to it and I'm like I don't even know what that is anymore. So oh, no. you'd have to go <laughs> back and redo it or, or you know I, I remember walking on gravel and thinking how great that sounded and recording that and uh -huh. I go back and all I hear is my breathing. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So like, oh, okay. That's not going to work. No. So has, has that been one of the, like, is that kind of like maybe the hardest part of your productions is like trying to recreate these sounds or. I think we're creating the effects. It's, it's probably time consuming and challenging. It's very enjoyable because I, I know what sound I want and it's, it's creative to try to figure out what you can do to try to make the sound you want. For an example, in uh, Casco Montiato, mm -hmm. I've got uh, Montresor being told by Fortunato to go over and grab two flambeau out of the sconces. And so you hear like metal flambeau holders being removed from wall, wall sconce, you know, contraptions. Okay. In order to do that, I had a, a brass cup from India that my grandpa sent to my grandma in 1944 uh -huh. that I just used on a wooden stool and just slid it across a wooden stool. And it sounds perfect as uh, wow. metal scraping against metal. So just what sound do I want and having to kind of create what do I think can get me there, even if it's absolutely not a wall sconce being used you know, to bring torches mm -hmm. out. It's still something that the listener can understand because it was just asked for that effect happened people will buy it. Yeah. That's oh, that is, that is really neat. I just, I, I, I love all creative aspects and just being able to create that kind of stuff and just mm -hmm. think, you know, how, like you said, you kind of think of the end in mind where this is what I want it to sound like, where, how far do I have to go to get that sound? You know, right. to think of all the different things. Well, and you know, some of it is organic and mm -hmm. some of it is post-production. Right. And, okay. and I found that during Cask of Amontillado, where uh, Brennan and I were in the sound booth together and really feeding off each other's reactions to the mm -hmm. script, that because Fortunato was wearing this this uh, jester's hat the whole time, mm -hmm. okay. uh, he's got bells jingling. <laughs> I wanted the bell jingle to not be put in after the fact. So I took a small Christmas ornament that I had that had about 15 bells on it. And I just held it against my shoulder. And okay. so as we did the discussion back and forth, every time I turned, you heard what sounded like an organically moving series of bell jingles because you would move your head. It would sound a different way. And right. it's hard to capture that after the fact. So okay. we just did it live while we were recording and left it in. That yeah, cool. That's awesome. That is amazing. Yeah. And oh. that goes very well with the creative process. And it just mm -hmm. tells you that, anyone whether it be poe whether it be orson wells whether it mm -hmm. be jason hitchcock. you know hitchcock mm -hmm. anyone that sometimes the best things are just natural yes mm -hmm. that absolutely you, it just happens and that's just what the you know life in itself is great because mm -hmm. sometimes it just happens yeah yeah so yeah and i, I mentioned earlier about what other writers and i'm a huge jules verne fan Okay. And yes. As I was, you know, reading uh, more and more about Poe, is how many other writers were influenced by him. You yes. know, Joseph Conrad wrote a very nice, uh, you know, uh, review of manuscript found in a bottle, and he mm -hmm. he 
you know, lauded Poe for his work. And, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was very influenced by him and Jules Verne. And, you know, he had a lot of these things that were that were written way before the people we just talked about were writing their stories. Mm -hmm. And even today, what Mystery Writers of America, you know, their their you know, top award is the Edgar. You know, Absolutely. so, you know, yes. he, he influenced so many different genres from sci-fi to mystery to to horror and gothic works. It's it's uh, amazing how many things really he had the baseline for. I, I agree. And I mean, and that's kind of what our, you know, we call it our podcast, you know, is all about is just how much that Edgar Allan Poe has influenced mm -hmm. so many different things. Mm -hmm. And it just, it keeps going and going, you know, I always say forevermore. And it, it just, we love to talk about it and dig into these rabbit holes. I know when Jeannie and I both do research separately, mm -hmm. we come back and, you know, talk about everything and, you know, decide, you know, what we're going to do. And then we'll say, well, oh my gosh, we found this. And, we, that's going to be a whole new episode that we didn't know about. And so it's, right. just, it's so neat to see. And, um, and yeah, you know, while I love the horror that Poe wrote, it's some of my favorites. There's so much more to him that we want people to know because he was so diverse and uh, in his writing and so talented in so many different areas. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah and in his life. Yes. Because sometimes some of his most interesting aspects had nothing to do with his writing. Right. It was just him. And you're going, okay, that's just creepy, but all right, that's <laughs> Poe. Well, his whole life is his is a Poesque tale. Exactly. Definitely. And I know um, like right now, like in for me, um, I teach freshman English. And so we've been doing Romeo and Juliet. We just kind of got started. Mm -hmm. And so, um, like I said, we're talking, we're adding in a lot of poetry right now because they need a lot of work on analyzing. And so um, I taught a Christopher Marlowe poem. And then they, today on Poe's birthday, I did this, you know, specifically for this. Um, you let them analyze on their own uh, a dream within a dream because it tied into when Romeo talks about mm -hmm. dreams and Queen Mab and all that. And whenever I've brought up Poe, and then I, I wore this to school too. And so they're like, is that Poe on your shirt? <laughs> and so it, it got a lot of chuckles and stuff today. And they know I love Poe. But um, when um, we I bring up Poe, or if anything's mentioned, they're mm -hmm. always just like, oh, he's so creepy. He married his cousin, you know, and then I tell them other things too. And they're like, yeah, oh, we didn't know that. <laughs> and so um, again, just, you know, in imparting the love of Poe and, you know, hopefully this new generation, you know, more into TikTok and things like that mm -hmm. will, you know, see like productions like you guys are doing and listen to them and appreciate them, you know, and people to keep on doing what we're all doing to promote him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be nice. I'd let, you know, and, and just by the sheer fact, it's 214th birthday yes. you know, today. Uh, yes. Obviously, the work is no less popular now than than it ever has been. And uh, the amount of people and groups and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, productions and movies and every, I mean, it just keeps keeps growing. So that's definitely a positive sign. I, I agree. And mm -hmm. I was going to say, since we're talking about his birthday right now. Um, so my my husband and I um, love tiki type stuff. And so we came up with a cocktail I'm going to grab yours. Yep. And so um, he was able to, he put it in my Raven glass. This is from, um, well, you can't see it very well because it frosted over, but this is um, from Raven beer up in Maryland and the glass is from. And so um, we came up with what we are calling the six degrees of Tiki Po. And so he has shared this uh, recipe with some of our, uh, our Tiki group that we're in. And the one reason why we kind of wanted to do it tiki style, not just because we like tiki, but when you think about Poe, you add Vincent Price portraying so many of Poe's stories so well. And you also add in that little extra of Vincent Price was 
on the Brady Bunch with his tiki <laughs> idol, just a little bit of tiki there. Oh, so Lord, it kind of brings, bring in the Brady I'm Bunch. Doing it. Okay. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm All right. Doing it. And so, um, so anyway, so that's what we did. And so we tried, we did six ingredients. And so um, there's, you know, the sweetness of simple syrup. And I'm going to add the uh, recipe on our website and uh, Facebook and Twitter later on this evening. But you have the sweet of the simple syrup for his, you know, poetry. You have the uh, blood orange juice for the horror. Mm -hmm. You have chili bitters for the spicy. He was a critic and, you know, he mm -hmm. had that sharp tongue. Um, cognac to kind of represent a lot of the 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 time frame um, that Poe lived in. And usually in like the Poe toaster also use cognac for the toast. Um, falernum, which really brings it into tiki, which is very surrealistic when you think about the flavorings of how it tastes. And then you have Amontillado. You had to have Amontillado sherry, and that kind of brings in the science. And so it ties in all of the things about Poe in this cocktail. <laughs> That's so, awesome. So if we will, let's raise our glass to Mr. Edgar Allan Poe on his yep. 214th birthday. So cheers and happy, happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Yes. So, mm -hmm. well, Jason, it has been an absolute pleasure yes. having you on the podcast. And if you would share out um, where everyone can find you, I love that you've got it on your screen, but if you want to kind of share out verbally. Absolutely. So all of our work can always be found on our website, which is at www.markywitzaudioworks.com listed right there above my head. Okay. And then we do have a separate page, which uh, this is my information here that you see on the screen. But if you go, go to YouTube, Marky What's Audio Works Presents, go to Facebook, Marky What's Audio Works Presents, you'll find our company, quote unquote, page, as well as uh, our trailers and uh, productions there on YouTube as well. And so we we produce um, audio dramas um, that started with Edgar Allan Poe went into some Christmas productions and now we're moving, you know, into what our next uh, long work will be. And we're probably leaning toward treasure Island, as I said earlier, but we'll see what, uh, what takes shape, but um, you know, you can find a lot of work there, but you can always catch us on the website. All right. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. And just, uh, we will be uh, sharing this uh, video and audio, um, audio on Spotify, video out on our YouTube channel. And you can also find us on Twitter, on Facebook. We have our web page. We always remind all of our viewers and listeners yep. of all of those. Where you can find us. I've forgotten anything. Let's see. Twitter, Facebook. No, I think you got it all. Uh, website and YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I think that's our main, our main things. Spotify. We also are on uh, Sirius XM platforms. Yes. And we're on a lot of different. We're not um, on Apple yet. Yeah, but I think Stitch. I yeah. Think Stitch. Stitcher. We've added a lot of different platforms for the, for the actual yeah. audio part of it. So just hunt down six degrees of Edgar Allan Poe and you'll find us. Yes. And mm -hmm. on Tuesday, please join us. Uh, we have a link on our webpage mm -hmm. on Co Unplugged and Jason is going to be joining us again and we're going to be talking about yes. the Raven and horror elements in the Raven specifically mm -hmm. and we might get to hear a little clip from his production of the Raven yes. while we're um, discussing it mm -hmm. so please go out to our website um, and at, at the Po Unplugged tab and sign up for that and we'll send you a zoom link and we will be zooming together tuesday evening yep at so, 7 30 central time and we look forward to anyone or seven central to, time sorry seven central yeah time. since seven central yes. um anyone that wants to join us it is basically the unbook club yes <laughs> <laughs> but poe inspired yes uh so it, it it's become something of um interesting yes. discussions yeah psychologically we, we, not just literary mm -hmm. but 
we all get to look into different aspects of understanding from people's different points of view. So yeah. it's, it's a great place to everybody brings a little something yeah. different to the table. Mm -hmm. And it, some of the things that people have brought up have been things that we hadn't even thought of. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Oh, wow, that's a great way to think of things yeah. like that. So, so getting to know people from all over the United States, because we have people from the East coast all the way to the West coast. Yes. So. All right. Well, we thank everybody. Yes. And for this, we are Ho Out. Out. At midnight in the month of June, I stand beneath the mystic moon. An opiate vapor, dewy dim, exhales from out her golden rim. And softly dripping, drop by drop, upon the quiet mountaintop, steals drowsily and musically into the universal breath.